Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for the book launch of Feliceno Centurion. Um, it's a true pleasure uh, to be here with you and to present these uh, speakers. We are going, we're celebrating the reopening of the exhibition Feliceno Centurion Abrigo, that's curated by Gabriel Perez Barreiro. He's going to be opening the floor. Um, presenting the artist and the show, which he curated at America Society, and which opened last uh, February 14. Um, we have extended it uh, now that we've been able to reopen until November 20, and I hope that you have an opportunity to see the show, to visit it again if you already were there. Um, and we'll be happy to welcome you. We have a booking reservation to make everybody's visits uh, safe. Uh, so we're very happy and thrilled to be here. Um, so uh, the program is going to continue with um, the presentation by Karen Marta, the co-editor of the book, who is going to be discussing uh, the book's uh, conception, design, production, and ideas behind it. And finally, we are very, very happy to have um, Gabriel Perez Barreiro, who is um, the curator uh, of the Americas at, at the Tate. Uh, and he is going to be presenting on the artist, his context. So it's a true pleasure to have him with us uh, today. Thank you, uh, Pablo, for joining us. Um, so we're very excited. We're going to uh, share some slides. Um, before we start the program, I want to give a special thank you to the Institute for Studies on Latin American Art, which is uh, a wonderful collection of archives on, on Latin American art and a foundation that promotes uh, academic initiatives to study Latin American art through different universities, book publications, exhibitions. And they uh, have uh, helped us make this book possible with their financial and intellectual support. So thank you very much to everybody at ISLA. Uh, this would not be possible without your support. And also a special thank you to the team at America Society, especially Diana and our new assistant curator, Natalia Viera, who really helped make everything ho happen behind and in front of the curtains. So thank you so much. Um, so with that, uh, Natalia, if we can share the presentation, please. Mm, we are going to open the floor to Gabriel. Let's wait one second while Natalia can uh, put up the slides. I'm going to let Gabriel talk a little bit about Centurion and the exhibition. Gabriel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Okay, great. It's always yes, to know. Great. Okay, well, um, good evening and uh, thank you everyone for being with us here tonight on this very special occasion. And I'd like to thank the American Society for this opportunity to um, to present what I think is a remarkable artist to a much broader audience. I would like to thank Aimee for the invitation and also Aimee and uh, Karen for having been editors of this uh, book that we're presenting today. And also, of course, Isla for its uh, support, which as Aimee said, is both uh, intellectual in terms of the archives and the support of the artist and also financial in terms of making this book, uh, this book possible. So thank you all. Um, I, I thought I would, I'm going to keep my comments uh, very brief tonight, but I'd like to sort of focus on first a, a very quick biographical sketch of who Feliciano Centurion was, and then a little bit about the exhibition Abrigo at, that, that's currently at the American Society, and which thankfully we can now uh, visit again after a very, very prolonged pause. So Feliciano was born in 1962 in San Ignacio Las Naciones in the interior of uh, Paraguay. And um, as at a certain point moved to the town of Alberti, which is uh, on the across the river from a town in Argentina called Formosa, which is where he started his art studies. So he was interested in art and you know trained uh, at an, from an early age uh, in that art school. 
1980, sort of in search of new horizons, he moved to the capital city, to Buenos Aires, um, and uh, started to, to finish his studies there at the National Art School. So to put a little bit of context, which I think is important here, uh, so he leaves Paraguay, which is in dictatorship. He arrives in an Argentina that is just about to transition out of its dictatorship. So by 1983, um, the return of democracy. And that return of democracy brought a huge cultural energy um, into the city and a, and a sort of renovation of that artistic scene in Buenos Aires. So he immediately sort of connects into that energy and really becomes a protagonist. The only, I would say the only non-Argentine protagonist of uh, a very specific movement that emerges around a cultural center run by the University of Buenos Aires called the Centro Cultural Ricardo Rojas, or the Rojas, as it's uh, more colloquially known. Um, so that generation of the Rojas uh, is important for many reasons, and Centurion in many ways sort of encompasses and embodies many of the uh, aesthetic and cultural and political ideas of that group. And what it had to do with, in many ways, was with the return to democracy, kind of the ability to focus on what we might call the personal as the political. Um, so self-expression, expression of one's most intimate sort of identity. And that covers from the ability to be out as a gay man and to sort of talk about sexuality in a much more open way, but also to talk about affect. Uh, that's why in these photos we're looking at now, we see many pictures of him with his friends, with the parties. And there's a reason for showing those pictures, which I think has to do with someone who, uh, for whom that was that sense of warmth, that sense of connection, that sense of intimacy uh, was very much a part of his artwork too. So that generation uh, breaking very much from the previous generation where there was a lot of work either engaged explicitly with the political repression of the time or sort of the large scale expressionist painting that was in vogue in the 1980s. This generation starts to recover a sense of the ready-made, of the kitsch, of the Baroque, um, of things that have been very much absent in the art history of the of the previous generation. So, so that sense of recovery, that sense of the personal, uh, you know, was something that he he really became, I think, a a leader and a uh, very emblematic artist in that sense. Um, so after his death in 1996, he passed away from uh, HIV related illness, and we'll we'll see how that illness kind of impacted his work. Uh, the work was. I wouldn't say invisible, but it was certainly harder to see. Um, and I think in the last few years, we've been able to um, encounter it more regularly, first through a series of exhibitions in, in Buenos Aires, through Alberto Sindros Gallery and a few other institutions. Also, uh, two years ago, I had the opportunity to present a solo show at the 33rd Sao Paulo Biennial. And this invitation from the American Society to present his work to a new audience was really, was really wonderful. So let's take a look at the um, at the exhibition that's currently on. If we could move the slides forward, Natalia. Um, so the exhibition is called Abrigo, and that was a uh, very a carefully chosen title. The, the title is in Spanish for a reason, which is that the word abrigo uh, encompasses a number of definitions that, that don't translate uh, uh, automatically into English. So it obviously means coat, uh, but it also means shelter. And, uh, and and shelter and refuge. And so that sense of it being both something that one can wear to protect themselves from the cold. We also have to remember that he's going from a warmer climate to a colder climate in moving to Buenos Aires. Um, but I think more importantly, this symbolic sense of connection, of affect, um, of warmth, of interpersonal warmth. So the first room of this gallery, when you walk into the American Society, the first thing you see are these uh, dinosaurs uh, and horses and animals that we see uh, in the middle of this image here. And they're these sort of very fierce uh, children's toys. And they're wearing these abrigos or these uh, coats. So these are sort of crocheted, uh, very, I would say, sort of kitschy, old fashioned, um, very feminine. Um, intentionally feminine. And that sort of dialogue between these fierce animals and their very sort of cute clothing, I think uh, really is a great place to start to think about his work uh, in deconstructing a kind of binary sense of, of gender, of culture, of expectations, of um, sort of high culture and low culture. Uh, it's all there sort of in those first um, objects. If we can move forward through the slides. <clears throat> 
So uh, the other thing we see in this first room, so, so the room really, the exhibition sort of picks up uh, after he's studied in Buenos Aires and the first expression of his, I would say, mature style are these large blankets, which we see here on the wall, which are painted with these wonderfully exuberant and uh, sort of extravagant animals. But we can also see the pattern of the original blankets. Now, these blankets are very cheap blankets. So there's kind of um, fibrous like reprocessed fiber blankets that we often use for packing or they're used um, also by uh, homeless people to keep themselves warm. So it's a very cheap material. And we see something again that's very common in his work, which is a recovery of a sort of discarded, cheap, kitsch, not valuable material sort of brought into the fine art realm by painting on top of them um, and painting these animals, which are both sort of humorous, a little bit threatening, but not. So again, we have that kind of ambivalence in the kind of image that he's doing. These are not works that, that sort of ram a message down your throat. Uh, they're very funny, they're very amusing, and they're uh, perhaps also sometimes a tiny little bit sinister. Um, so, so these works was kind of where he uh, established his mature language, moving away from more traditional sort of oil on canvas painting um, and enjoying and recovering this material. So if we can move forward the slides. Um, another view of that same room, if we can go forward. Then the second room of the exhibition um, kind of looks at the what I would call the middle period of his production. Um, so from the early 1990s, uh, sort of the turn of the 80s into the 90s. And what we have, we still have some of these blanket works, um, as you can see, for example, with the tigers on the side, and we'll probably talk about those in a little bit, uh, if we can move forward. Another one, maybe we have a detailed image. So, so these, um, yeah, these pieces here, for example, on the side of the blankets, these are, uh, many of them are objects that he would find in Onse, which is a popular market in Buenos Aires. And they're sort of, uh, um, again, sort of throwaway items. So there's, there's little tablecloths or one of them, a, a little sort of um, wine glass cozy these, um, uh, coasters, crocheted coasters, like things that are sort of belong to a vocabulary that's very distant from fine art, but that is very common in uh, in, in domestic, uh, particularly feminine environments. Um, and so he recovers these. And oh, the other thing we see, we can't see it so well in this image, is the incorporation of text. So many of the, many times he would find um, a particular composition and then hand embroider onto them. Uh, messages. And those messages are often about love, they're about vulnerability, they're about relationships. So again, not sort of the big ideas or not the, the sort of big political ideas, but the the personal political ideas, um, the idea of vulnerability, the, the ability to be able to express love and to be able to talk about deep emotions um, and make them explicit in this, in this particular context. We can move forward. And then the third room uh, with which we close the exhibition really deals with the uh, moment from his diagnosis with HIV and sort of the, the way that that illness becomes incorporated, it becomes an essential part of the work. Um, so that, that embroidery, those words, they, they start to talk very explicitly about his illness. Uh, there are many pieces where he's talking about sort of living with his illness, with facing mortality, many references to religion, he's a very religious person. Um, and uh, these these two vitrines we see at the in the front image, for example, are the are pillows onto which he hand embroidered these beautiful words like solitude, rest, um, divine light of the soul. So what we see as an artist who very clearly is um, talking about mortality, talking about love, uh, the relationship of the two, which obviously in his case was was very direct. Um, and to me, they're some of the most remarkable um, artworks of the second half of the 20th century in the sense of just how they managed to uh, incorporate this very human sense of vulnerability, of time passing, um, of, of observing the, the, the end of mortality as it kind of approaches. Um, and, and that perfect confluence between the intentions of his work, the materials of his work, the incorporation, the sewing, the thread, um, and in the ability to tell that extremely um, personal and very uh, poignant history. Um, so that in a, in a, as much as a nutshell as I can, um, is, is uh, what was behind this exhibition. The idea to give an overview of an artist who many people are unfamiliar with, at least in, 
in the New York context and to try to present these sort of three moments of his career um, and to show an artist who kind of um, incorporated and was able to deal with moments of sort of frivolity and moments of extreme seriousness uh, without necessarily feeling a contradiction between them. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabriel. Thank you so much for that beautiful presentation and for making the show so spectacular. So now we're gonna have Karen Marta, but before that, it, it was brought to my attention that uh, the sisters of Feliciano Centurion are watching this presentation. And I wanna especially thank them. I think both for Gabriel and I, it was true. I mean, Gabriel has been working with them for a very long time since he started his research with them. But um, it's, it's truly a pleasure to hear how much he was loved by his family and by his friends in Buenos Aires. Many of them we interview will talk about that, but um, thank you so much for being with us and for taking such good care of his legacy. So Karen, now we go to you. Good evening. Thank you, Ame. I'm the editorial consultant for American Society and I've worked on three books for them, Leah Nelson, Lydia Cabrera, and Eric Mayenberg. But this is the first book that I edited and produced with Ame. And so that was a great, it was a great pleasure to work with her. And I hope we work on more books. And Gabrielle, thank you very much. It was through you that I was able to, I hopefully get a sense of the artist and understand him better for the book. Um, a book is always a labor of love and it requires a kind of a family of people who work on them. So I would be, I wanted to thank Diana Plato who, and wish her well on her new endeavor. Todd Bradway, who did the production and honestly fell in love with the work of Centurion and took incredible care on the color of the images, the reproduction of the images, the materials that we use. For him, it was really a love story. And then uh, Garrett Gott, who is the designer, he actually was the designer of the Cabrera, the Leah Nielsen book, books and the, S and the series, the American Society pocketbook series. And so uh, I think he did a very, very, very good job on this book. And then there was Maddie Gilmore and Anton Hagen who helped us with the texts. So I wanted to thank them. I don't even know if they're listening. Um, okay, our original concept for this book was to embrace the kind of DIY, DIY or, or do-it-yourself attitude that characterized the Rojas, as well as the Lower East Side in New York in the 90s, something I'm more familiar with. And our idea, original idea, was to evoke the lively kind of cultural scene of that time and use it to contextualize Centurion's life and work and sort of honoring this joyous spirit that would... Uh, could we see the poster and the opening? So with this idea in mind, we started by creating, we, we had the idea to create a zine-like, a kind of 90s zine-like aesthetic. We thought we would use a very fine Japanese recycled paper that looks casual, but actually isn't, and a font that would make the book look kind of like a mimeographed announcement or something like this poster for this exhibition. Um, the idea, this idea seemed to speak to the archival material and photos of Centurion and his friends that Ame gathered when she was researching the exhibition in Buenos Aires. However, because until now there has not been a single book on Centurion's work in Spanish or English, we realized in the end that it made more sense for us to make a more traditional monograph rather than this kind of high concept project book. The monograph, making a monograph means that the work, the individual works have to be given enough room to be seen clearly, printed on a paper that allows the reader to experience the work and, and also present the texts so that the texts explicate the work. In other words, we moved very decisively that's an, that's a that's at the opening for that poster. Um, we we move from a portrait of the artist in the scene to a book about his work. 
Uh, and then the next next slide. Um, so nevertheless, in kind of a nod to the fact that Centurion used uh, everyday objects in his work, I we were I was reminded of a book that I love. It's uh, Andy Warhol's iconic 1975 book called The Philosophy of Andy Warhol from A to B and Back Again. And uh, it's not only that he you also used mass, mass produced materials, but it was this kind of slightly irreverent iconoclastic attitude that he brought to the design of this book, which is why we decided to refer to this table of contents tense in our book. So you can switch to our table of contents. And, um, and also it seemed very useful, this system, because many of the authors in the book are not really familiar names to the English reader. So the device of these short summaries of their text seemed to make, would be more useful for the reader. Maybe Ame, you could tell us a bit about the authors. Sure, Karen. Um, so uh, the first author, if we go to the beginning, is Tiso Escobar. Tiso Escobar is uh, uh, a fantastic, uh, not only art historian and museum director from Paraguay, but also somebody who has done a tremendous work on redefining the idea of aesthetics in South America. Um, he was especially perfect for Feliciano Centurion because he knew Feliciano and he actually curated his first exhibition in Asuncion, Paraguay uh, back in the 1980s. Um, and you, he has this fantastic text in which he doesn't only talk about you know, Feliciano's work, but specifically links it with the traditional folk uh, textile uh, techniques of Paraguay and tries to to deconstruct uh, the hierarchies of like, you know, high and low art, um, which is something he has done as a larger project in his intellectual project about um, aesthetics uh, from South America, but applies that to Centurion's work specifically, not only through his use of the folk, but also through the type of imaginary he does. So um, it's a fantastic essay. Um, he was originally invited, and oh, just a funny anecdote, he was too busy to write a new text, so we invited him to do an adaptation of a previous uh, text he had done for Gabriel's uh, uh, show of uh, Centurion in the Biennial. Uh, but he finally got inspired and wrote something completely new from the scratch, and the text is fabulous. Um, then uh, I have a very short text in which I decompose a manifesto uh, that Feliciano Centurion once wrote about his use of coats. And then we have uh, a Which text we use by. I'm uh, oh, sorry, we use that. A, the epigraph. Mm -hmm. As the epigraph of the book. Thank you, Karen, for the reminder. And then we also have a wonderful text by Gabriel Perez Barreiro um, analyzing the work, uh, presenting uh, Feliciano's uh, personal and professional life journey and contextualizing him in the Buenos Aires 1919, but also internationally. Um, uh, we also have the republication of a text uh, on Feliciano Centurion by Jorge Guimier Mayer. Uh, he was a very important figure and not so, so, you know, not so much known internationally, but a key figure of 1990s Buenos Aires art. He's a curator and he was the founder and director of the Centro Cultural Rojas at the time when Centurion was exhibiting and really the if you want to say commander behind this like a uh, group of artists uh, in around the Rojas Cultural Center. And um, this text he wrote uh, after Centurion's passing and is a fantastic poetic reading on his work. Finally, uh, we have uh, two more texts by Argentinian authors that have analyzed the 1990s scenes. Uh, Jimena Ferreiro contributed a text contextualizing the Rojas explaining uh, the the space uh, aesthetics and um, production, and also uh, the historical context in which these works were being made, um, and you know the artists with which uh, Feliciano Centurion was interacting with. 
And Francisco Lemus uh, coordinated a beautiful conversation with uh, three artists that were very good friends and roommates. Um, two of them were roommates of Feliciano Centurion, Ana Lopez, Marcelo Pombo, and Cristina Schiavi, that gave testimony of uh, his. Uh, you know, his role in the art scene of the 1990s, but also how he was as a person. Um, we also have a bibliography and an exhibition history, and then uh, the play section, which Karen can talk more about. Thank you, Ami. Um, if you go to the next slide. Okay, this is the cover, and the decision to photograph and then re-photograph the artwork details led to the concept for the cover. The details inform the design because they reveal the artist's hand and the delicacy of his technique, as well as the variety of the surfaces that he used. So we wanted readers, including those who are not really aware yet of his work, to get a sense of the tactility of the work. So we chose to wrap a detail of the legs of the animal, which is specific to South America. Could you go to the next, and you can see here the uh, detail on the cover. This is the animal. May, I didn't know this animal before Ami explained to me, which maybe she can do for you, um, about this animal. So um, this was an interesting case uh, when when we were seeing the different representations of flora and fauna in Centurion's work, uh, the piece that ended up going for the cover uh, was this, you know, the legs. I mean, it's a section, it's a detail of a work. Um, and many people thought it was a dog, but just because I come from the same cultural context, I was able to identify that it's actually an Aguarawasu, which is a wild type of canine uh, that lives in the area where uh, Feliciano Centurion was born. So it's very interesting because uh, Centurion depicted different types of animals. Many of them uh, are not native to where he's from, but he has a few cases uh, in which he chooses native animals. We have a surubi, which is a type of catfish in one of the big um, blankets. And then we have this aguarabasu and a fish and a type of deer also. So if you have a chance to buy the book, which I hope you do, um, you'll be able to see there. Uh, the and then and, and actually we didn't we thought it was a deer. <laughs> but used here, this is an example of the different placements. This is a detail, as Ame said, from the work. But we made many different examples, placing the legs so that they would wrap on the front, the back, and the spine. So, and we also wanted the reader to see and to be able to experience uh, the artist's decision to add green leaves. He he actually painted more leaves on there, and also, of course, the legs and the animal are made by him. So this cover felt to us that rather than focusing on a kind of the tr more the tragic his tragic death there's ill tragic the tragedy of his death we wanted to communicate more this playful attitude he had and so this and also this tactility which I think this cover uh, succeeded in doing okay the next slide. Uh, these are. This is an example of some of the patterns on the blankets and quilts that he found in the market that Gabrielle was describing, and and the way he he exaggerated certain aspects of the patterns and he complimented others. And uh, and Ame, I wasn't really familiar with these blankets, although I had seen the photographs of the of the work. So Ame sent me. You can go to the next slide photographs of a place where in Buenos Aires where you buy these blankets is this yeah, isn't a market actually a factory where they make them right well it's actually not the factory this is the Onse neighborhood so it's a series of streets where you 
uh, find uh, somehow a specialization by type of project. It's a whole neighborhood where you can buy uh, usually um, wholesale products. And there's a series of streets where they specifically sell, sell fabrics. And people told me, many artists and friends of him told me how he loved to go to these markets in Buenos Aires and similar ones in Paraguay. And so I took a little trip to try to find uh, the blankets. I actually found some of the specific blankets that Centurion was using and got the name of the factory where they are made. And so, I mean, we couldn't accomplish the task because of COVID, but we're actually getting some of the original blankets that he painted on that are still being produced nowadays. So that was quite beautiful. The factory is a small factory in the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, run by a doctor who inherited the business and they still make them. These are very popular blankets that people use to sleep, to wrap things, you know, but uh, they're still being used by middle class families all over the country. It's so interesting. And then in order to enhance the materiality of the cover, we used a paper that imitated the cloth of the original blanket we ch and chose a weave in the paper that very closely, as closely as we could find, resembles the artwork. So the goal was for the reader to have the uncanny sense that they were holding in their hand, like the artist did, a swatch of the blanket. So, and because the pandemic, we, we ended up being able to sort of take advantage of the extended time frame the pandemic afforded. So we could go through innumerable sample books to find this perfect paper, both for the cover and one that complemented the paper in the interior. We landed on a paper with a very rough feel, and then we printed the cover very carefully so the details and the colors match almost perfectly. I mean, it's it's really uncanny. Um, okay, then this is an example, actually, of a work and the detail, which you would find this actually, this page in the book, in the plate section. Um, and then after, this is another example. And then after we re we decided to reject this feeling of recycled, the recycled paper, we landed on for the plate section, a coated paper so that the color of the artwork would sit. This is a proofing picture of proofing so that the color of the artwork and the in the artwork would sit on the surface of the paper instead of receive, receding and being kind of drawn in so that it looks much closer to the way you would experience it. And we had to run many, many tests on various papers to find the perfect fit, which we did. The paper we finally chose is very warm and it relates really well to the color palette of the co color. And to this sort of personal DNA of Centurion. Um, and there, and there, this is a picture we used to open the book. And this is an example, which you probably can't tell, but it was a very small photograph and not in very good shape. So we took the time to retouch each of these images so that they're really perfect. And this is Centurion and his friends. And this is another example of a proofing sheet. So you can see the him uh, holding up the image against the actual artwork, which is a great luxury to be able to do this, to photograph and then use the original artworks to check the colors. So we took total advantage of that luxury, thanks to Ami. Thank you very much. I hope that you all are able to hold the book in your hands soon. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, before we pass to Pablo, um, a parochial note, uh, like we say in Spanish, uh, you can uh, get the book on our website and also at uh, the DAP website, which is distributing the book. Natalia will be sharing the link with all of you in the chat now. Uh, we will show it again. But now it is my true huge pleasure to have Pablo Leon de la Barra, um, fantastic curator, a great friend. Um, thank you so much, Pablo, for being with us and for accepting to participate. Um, Pablo 
has talked and gave presentations on Felicena Centurion before, and he's going to offer us his view. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aimee. Uh, thank you, everyone that's uh, with us tonight. Uh, hope you hear me well, because I'm uh, I, I'm speaking from, from home in Rio de Janeiro, and the internet here, sometimes it's terrible. So let's see how it goes. If we start running into, into trouble, just interrupt me, and we change to telephone. OK? So uh, before before I begin, um, I mean, I wanted to congratulate Aimee for the job she's doing at America Societies. I met Aime 2013 when I arrived to New York to work for the Guggenheim and immediately fell in love with her uh, intellectual thought. And it's great to see her seven years later uh, at America Society. And uh, um, I've been very quiet during the quarantine. I, most of the time I've, I've stayed home. I haven't accepted any invitations to participate in any live talks. But because this was something we were already going to do live physically in May, and because of my respect for Feliciano's uh, work, uh, I knew I had to be here. On the other hand, I've been following the talks you've been doing every, it's every Thursday, you know, in uh, America society. And uh, what's amazing is how you've opened the door to a new generation uh, who have taken over America society, a new generation of artists from all over the Americas and uh, making, uh, making them available and, and their work and their voices uh, to, a, to a wider, to a wider um, group of people. So thank you for that, uh, I may. To Gabriel, uh, thank you for doing that show, for continuing our conversations, and especially for that great presentation that you okay. uh, now, now you're good, now you're good. Yeah. So uh, I can't wait to have the book in my hand. I, I read it yesterday night in PDF, so... Um, so I really want to, to have that, uh, that, that opportunity. The book is beautiful, the texts are great. Especially I enjoyed the text on, uh, on the Rojas, which uh, widened my horizon of, uh, of, of Centuriano's, uh, Centuriano's work. Uh, I love the small pocket books that, uh, that American Society has been doing with Marta, but uh, to find out that this is not gonna be a pocket book, it's gonna be a, a proper, uh, proper bigger book. So that gets me very excited. So basically what I'm going to show is a series of images and think uh, Feliciano in a, in a wider context. So if we can move to the, to the images. And uh, are, you are you hearing me okay, uh, Aime, or do I need to change the phone? I think you're okay. I think now you're okay. Okay. So I just wanted to start with this image of the Museo del Barrio in Paraguay. Contextualize uh, Feliciano's work, no? And uh, it's a museum that was founded by Tizio. You talked about Tizio, and which has the particularity of showing indigenous, colonial, and contemporary art hand in hand. And I'm showing it because one, uh, nobody ever goes to Paraguay. Paraguay is one of our great uh, mysteries, no? Uh, us who study Latin America, nobody knows what's what's happening there. So going there uh, opened my eyes to. Uh, understanding better Centuriano's, uh, Feliciano's practice, but also the practice of other artists that are, that are there. And what you see at the museum is two things which, uh, which work as a code to, to understanding further uh, Feliciano's work. One, the, the Guarani textiles uh, that are in the museum, but also the, the, crochet, uh, the crochet weavings, uh, where, which there's a big collection and a big tradition of it in Paraguay. You know? And you can, I mean, you can clearly see the influence that this that did, this had in his life. Uh, Feliciano didn't show in the museum uh, while alive. No, he had an exhibition there, 2013, uh, curated by Fernando David. That was one of the of the exhibitions that really kind of brought him uh, to my attention. And uh, and if we go to the next image. So really, uh, I mean, what, what, what I attempt to, to do is to, to, think, um, to think Feliciano's work in a wider uh, ground, to think um, how he dealt uh, with issues of his own uh, homosexuality, but also his uh, AIDS uh, and HIV and, uh, and the illness uh, related to it. And just starting with these early paintings of him, of, uh, of bodies, bodies in the dark, 
uh, surrendering to each other. You know, the idea of, uh, of homosexual desire as something that was prohibited. And how he his parting point for these early works is this idea of, of giving light and giving visibility to these to these bodies. No? The next one, please. The idea of the sky always present in his work in different uh, in different moments. Uh, I like to relate to the idea of the of the blanket, but also to the idea of the of the shelter, the sheltering sky that appears so much in uh, in Paul Bowles, no? And it's something that I also want to relate uh, to some of the artists, which I'm going to relate Feliciano's uh, work. No? The next one, please. The idea of the pillow also, no? which is something, one of the, one of the echoes uh, of his work with the work of other artists uh, working during the period. Especially, um, especially that one that says soledad, no? solitude, the idea of being, uh, being alone. No? The idea of dreaming, of uh, resting, but also the loneliness of uh, of his situation. The next one, and I wanted to put him in dialogue with these photos that I found yesterday uh, that appeared on my feed on in Instagram. This is Sunil Gupta, uh, Indian uh, British photographer from the '80s, still working now, and this series of photos that he did of uh, of gay couples in the '80s, no. And he said something that really kind of uh, made me think uh, and um, about about the context in which we, these artists were working, which is something that we we shouldn't forget, no. And uh, and he says, uh, I think people forget how difficult it was. Gupta says, no, how there was no representation of anything, how you really felt alone, and then to have found somebody, even one other person, was very remarkable. I don't think we would have survived the eighties if we hadn't found each other. So the idea of, uh, I mean, it's, it's 30 years ago, no? the, the 80s, it's, it feels like, like it was yesterday, but so many things have changed regarding to our, our relationship with, uh, with being gay. No? And at that time, it wasn't, no? it was, uh, it was, uh, it had to, you had to deal with it with being alone. And uh, and finding uh, finding those others with whom you belong, and I think that uh, that for Feliciano, I mean, this not only happened in his in his personal relationships, but also happened through art, and also uh, happened through the community of artists and friends that uh, that he created at El Rojos. So I think that's why those photos that you showed at the beginning are so important because because they really um, they really show uh, how he found a space and a and a shelter. And a, and a sky under which to work under under this group of, of friends. No, uh, what I'm going to show next is a series of images of other artists uh, originally from Latin America who had to deal with uh, with similar conditions, who had to face their own uh, homosexualities, who had to face face uh, the, the HIV uh, virus. Most of them, uh, which also died uh, in a relationship, in a, in a, in a, with the idea to create a context uh, or a wider context to understand uh, Feliciano's work, but also part of our research the, of an exhibition that a future exhibition that I've been working on, which uh, I mean sometimes when I joke I call it uh, radical homosexuals, but which deals with the uh, homosexual artistic practices in uh, Latin America in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. No, so it's so really from. From uh, the activism of the of the 60s to the coming out uh, during the 70s, and then the crisis of AIDS, no, and the representations that, that come with it. And of course, we we need to talk uh, of uh, of Felix Gonzalez Torres in relationship to uh, Feliciano. And two images here that for me uh, really echo and, uh, and enter in dialogue with uh, Feliciano's work: no? the idea of the pillows, uh, the empty bed, but where, where where there was another one. Sleeping and the idea again of the sky, no, the, the bird flying alone in freedom in the sky. The idea again of the sky as a shelter and the freedom of the sky. The next one. With uh, with Felix, the idea of finding the other is also there. No, the idea of the two clocks uh, giving the same time, uh, moving together at the same time, but also in the in the work next to it. Um, Untitled March 5th, which is the date uh, uh, that his lover Ross died of uh, HIV, of AIDS related illness. Two uh, light bulbs went to each other, knowing that one light bulb will, uh, will turn off. No? So the idea of, uh, of dead uh, presence in, uh, in this works. No? The next one. 
again, Felix and, uh, and the presence of Ross, the, the corner of Candice with the weight of Ross. So inviting uh, the viewer to, to be participant in, a, in the morning of, uh, of the lover. And a drawing uh, which de deals with blood works, you not know, the idea of, uh, of the blood cells and, uh, and losing immunity because of, uh, of the blood cells. So um, again, uh, this idea of, of losing, uh, losing the loved one, but also knowing that one uh, is going to die. And I think it's important to talk about all this because, uh, I mean, there's been a lot of talk recently also about the, the kind of uh, whitewashing of uh, Felix's work, you know, of forgetting the context and the... And, uh, and the reasons why it, why it happened. No? Uh, next one. Again, uh, this one, blood, a uh, series of bead curtains through which you have to pass through. No, So the idea of making you aware of the loss happening through HIV. Uh, next one. And this beautiful one, uh, untitled Golden. No, Here, it's more the transition uh, to another life no? uh, that... Uh, passing through the golden curtain and uh, the body physically uh, passing uh, to the next uh, to the next stage you know? next one another artist that uh, one has to think uh, talking about Feliciano it's Leonilson Leonilson also had a show a few years ago at America's uh, society the idea again of uh, suing of um, of uh, of something that's considered more feminine, but using it as a way uh, of expression, no? <coughs> Through the work of, uh, of Leonilson, no? The idea of, uh, of the empty man, the idea of nobody, of not having the other, no? So, so a much more uh, solitary work, no? I think in contrast, when we talk about Feliciano's work, the idea of, uh, of of a belief in life is uh, is very present in his his work, and we'll see that in contrast uh, soon. Next one, the last uh, the later works of uh, of Leonilson. No? He died ninety three, so these are ninety one and ninety two. So the idea of the wound, no? of uh, of knitting the the wound, and the idea of emptiness. No? So again, the the pain of uh, of knowing that 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 is, that he's gonna die. I, the, the earlier works are much more figurative. And really, he goes to the minimal idea again of, of here the cloth, you know, the covering cloth, which reminds us of of those that are covered, those are that are dying, those that are sick. You know? Next one, please. Another artist which I would like to put uh, in relationship to, to him, Rafael Franza, who exiled himself, uh, went to study to Chicago, from, originally from Porto Alegre, uh, stayed there because he was a uh, homosexual. And this beautiful video of him, uh, prelude to. Uh, and announced that where, uh, while the song of La Traviata is being sung, he's hugging and kissing uh, his lover, who he knows he's going to die. But also the names of all those that have died uh, appear in the video. No? Next one. Uh, general idea, the, um, the collective of artists formed by A. A. Bronson, Felix Parks, and Venezuelan artist Jorge Sontal who made this campaign, campaign uh, transforming uh, Robert and Diana's uh, love into AIDS, giving visibility to the virus, no? a virus that, uh, that people didn't want to talk about, that even the president of the United States, Reagan at the time, was not talking. Uh, there was no, uh, no, 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 uh, no support being given to the, to the people that were dying. Uh, if we go back to that exact moment, um, I mean, uh, people with AIDS would be uh, would become totally isolated. No families would not uh, even want to touch people because they were afraid of being uh, being uh, contact contagiated. No, so I I think that the idea of, of of the virus and the presence of the virus and uh, and people dying of the virus is something that again we 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 tend to forget uh, 25 years later when uh, when now there's prep people can uh, can again. Uh, and can can have sex in a in a in a more relaxed way, but uh, but really what it meant, you no? Know? I mean, people were were dying in uh, and disappearing in questions of months, you no? Know? Those that couldn't have access to treatment would would die, you no? Know? Next one, please. 
Roberto Jacobi and Kimi Science, the fabulous nobody. Uh, again, uh, a T-shirt that they made as a, as as, a, as part of this awareness, uh, saying "Yo tengo sida" in uh, in Buenos Aires. Next one. And this beautiful uh, series of paintings by Santiago Garcia Science and other artists in Buenos Aires of an older generation uh, who also uh, contracted uh, HIV and who painted this beautiful uh, uh, price in the missions, in the, in the missiones, in the, in the area between, uh, between Paraguay, Brazil, and, uh, and Argentina. No? This Christ uh, dying in their beds because they have uh, contracted HIV. So the amount of deaths and the, how a whole generation was, uh, was erased, you know, present in Santiago Garcia Sainz uh, work. And currently uh, working in an exhibition of his to happen, it was supposed to be opening this month. Uh, hopefully we'll have it next year in Buenos Aires. So, so also discovering this incredible body of work in relationship to, uh, to Felicianos. No? Uh, next one, please. And finally, this this photograph. It's not uh, it's not a Latin American artist, but it's David Borja uh, Norwix, who did travel to to Mexico, travel to Argentina, and this is a photograph of his uh, of his partner uh, Peter Huyer uh, when he died of uh, of, uh, of HIV uh, related uh, illness. So really, this remembrance that uh, that people were were dying and disappearing, and that they knew that their time in uh, that their time uh, was going to be short. No? Uh, in the book, uh, Feliciano says, uh, "I know I don't have uh, long, uh, long left." No, so this knowing that uh, that that your life is going to end. Uh, I mean, that there's not much time left. Radically changes his work, changes the work of many of these artists, and. Um, and makes him do this work, which has a sense of urgency, a sense of uh, a sense of life, uh, a desire for life, no, uh, present uh, in their work, no. On one hand, uh, AIDS um, gave visibility to all this uh, generation of uh, of homosexual artists, no. They uh, they they brought people uh, out of a closet uh, in a way, kind of also normalized homosexuality later, and many of the. Of the of the rights that we have today uh, had to do with this kind of visibility that uh, that AIDS gave to a, to a generation of, of homosexuals. No? That the homosexual was not anymore uh, the the sinner having dirty sex in a in in a in a dark street, but that the people that were dying who were homosexuals were your brother, your husband, your uh, best friend from school. People that you knew, you know, and that uh, was something that AIDS changed. But also, what changed was that we lost a generation, you know, and that this generation was not able to transmit us their their knowledge and to communicate with the generations that that followed, no. And uh, I guess that's the importance of Feliciano's uh, uh, work, no, that this uh, urgency of knowing he was going to leave this earth made him send us these signals. Um, which we are able to uh, to to access today. No, next image, please. So, if you think, uh, I mean, Feliciano was was born 1962, so he would be 10 years older than me. No, I'm, I'm born in 72. He would be 58 years old. I mean, he would still be alive. No, and, and, and it's shocking to think that that he died being. Uh, being 34 years old, you know, that these works that he did, which are so powerful and so strong, were done by someone that was 34 years old and was dying. You know? And that's something that we forget sometimes in the beauty of the work. You know? And I, I thought that it was important to bring it forward and to put it in context and to put it in dialogue with these other voices that we're producing at the same time. You know? So some last works of, uh, of Feliciano that appear in the catalog, just to finish this. But this work, uh, which has to do with his blood cell count, again, relating, uh, which we could relate to, to those works by Felix Gonzalez. Uh, next one. This works talking, uh, saying, El cielo es mi protección, the sky is my shelter. Dead is an uh, intermittent part of, of my days. And uh, this one, uh, I'll, I'm reborn every moment. No? So this idea of rebirth, uh, Always also present in the work. In the work, no. Next one. The works that uh, that we have at the at the Guggenheim uh, 
kindly gifted by our Latin American circle, two beautiful small works, no? And I think also in, in Centurion also, the idea of the transition from the big blank canvas to the smaller and much more intimate works is very important, no? The idea of coming close to the work, to having this intimate relationship to them, of him doing this, uh, these smaller works. Here, uh, estoy despierto, I'm awake, no? And florece, I, I, I flourish, no? So again, upon that, always this idea of being alive, no? Of continue aiming and, uh, and uh, desiring uh, life. Uh, next one, please. These two works, probably uh, two of my favorite ones, uh, The Bird of Paradise, Flowering, which is a reference to him to being born in, uh, in, the, in, in the city of Misiones, where he comes from, around this vegetation but also going to the city where he, where he flowers, no? And even though he, he knows that he, he'll, he'll die, this idea of, uh, of flowering, of, of rebirth. And finally, uh, this flower, this beautiful flower, which says, estoy vivo, I'm alive, no? And uh, these are the signals that, uh, that Feliciano left for us, these signals of life, which continue to pulsate and resonate on till today. So thank you, Aime, thank you, Gabriel, for doing this incredible work of, uh, of making available uh, the work for, uh, for, for, for the generations of today, but also to wider audiences. And uh, I, would, uh, I would love to see the show live, and I would love to hold the catalog in my hands. And, uh, and I think this is, with this I end, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Pablo. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beautiful presentation and for the great contextualization that you offer. Um, so um, before I open for questions, I invite everybody to leave questions on the chat and we will read them out loud while you type in your questions that you may have. Um, I want to remind everybody that uh, the book will be available in our website, Amazon, and also in the DAP website, which is the distributor of the book soon, and in bookstores, for at least for those that are reopened, hopefully soon. And that the exhibition will be up until November 20. You can book an appointment. It's very easy to do that online and come with friends, you can book the appointment on the same day. And we really hope that you have a chance to see it if you're in New York. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, Gabriel, Karen. I don't, I don't have a question. I have a, I have, I just wanted to thank Pablo Leon for what I thought was some really beautiful um, really beautiful analysis of the world of the work and this very necessary contextualization you know that that what's what's so remarkable to me about Feliciano's work is it's so personal he's, he's so in his interior world and at the same time you know in this kind of constellation he's so connected to what's happening around the world but not connected in the way of somebody who's sort of googling other artists and reading art forum to try and figure out what's going on it's something much deeper and much more spiritual that's that's kind of connecting this this spirit this this kind of urgent mortality that that um unfortunately you know suddenly becomes so real in that generation um so so i thought it was a very uh very thought-provoking and, and poetic and beautiful reading so it's not a question it's a, it's a little bit of praise thank you gabriel um, you showing your words. Um, and is anyone in the audience a question? I, I read Fabian. Fabian, you can type your question. Um, again, I want to thank uh, the family of Feliciano Centurion, who is live uh, watching the event. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Jody. Uh, um, everybody in the family has been so supportive of the work. And um, I also want to thank uh, again for a second time Isla, the Institute for Studies in Latin American Art, that was fundamental to make this project happen. Their support to so many initiatives related to the arts of the Americas is really important for those of us working in the field. So 
So thank you so much again, especially to Ariel I6, uh, to Guadalupe Gonzalez, Planta Serrano, uh, and uh, Mercedes Cohen, who were very involved in this project. Mm. Uh, we're getting some thank you and from Felipe and other people. I don't know if anybody has any comment question. I mean, it was truly a beautiful event and I am really thankful to Gabriel for the fantastic show he put up for bringing this project to America society. Um, you, for the patience of Gabriel and everybody during these very complicated times to make an exhibition, to make a book. Uh, that goes also to Karen, to Todd, to everybody in the team, to Diana, to Natalia now. I mean, these are especially difficult times to be producing culture, to be producing books, exhibitions, and it requires a double effort from everybody. So thank you so much uh, for being there, for helping, for being so generous and thank you to the audience and I hope you can see the show and get the book. Okay, I do have a question before we go by Eileen Kahn. Um, Eileen is asking, you speak about how he elevated quotidian materials to high art. Has connection been made by delicate nature uh, of materials to his health condition? Mm -hmm. I think that's a question for Gabriel to respond. Um, what do you think, Gabriel? He's the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let me just read the question again. And yeah. the delicate nature of the show. I think that there is, um, it, it's, it's sort of tempting to see a relationship. And I think there is one. And Pablo made a reference to this too. And in the show, it's very clear that you go from the big blankets and the scale of the work kind of gets smaller and smaller. And I don't think that's, uh, that's accidental. I think that there is a question of wanting to kind of get more intimate, more sort of interpersonal, you know, objects that can be held in the hand that can sort of be occupy the space between two people. Um, so we see very few large scale works um, in the end of his production. So I think that there is something there. I think another thing that is important, there's, there's a beautiful video on the American Society website that was an initiative to ask um, curators and collectors and critics and people other artists to talk about a single work. And there's a beautiful video by, by Gustavo Brussoni, who's a key figure in the history of this generation, where he talks about the, 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 the stains on the fabric. So some of the, the fabrics were not sort of washed before working on them. Uh, many of them have, they kind of carry the marks of their life. Um, and again, I think that's not, that's not accidental. Um, if one wanted to, one could even take a Christian reading of that, of a Veronica's veil, um, you know, of a, of a stained fabric. Um, also something that sort of, um, I think the idea of this, the stain on linen as something that is dirty or something that is, um, you know, not, doesn't conform to a very conventional idea of beauty. Um, so, so I think all of this universe, there are very, very conscious and very specific choices that are being made there. Um, and definitely the choice of, of fabric is a very, um, personal and intimate medium. Um, so so I, I do agree with you, Eileen, and thank you for the question. Thank you, Gabriel, that was a beautiful answer. We have a question by uh, Shodi Centurion about where the book can be purchased. The book can be purchased in Amazon, and it will be available also on the DAP website. But just to make it super clear, you're gonna get a few copies yourself, so don't worry, Shadi. <laughs> you need to buy it. You are the sister of the artist. So we'll be mailing you one. Te vamos a mandar a ti, Shadi, pero bueno, acabo de explicar dónde se consiguen. Um, um, and thank you so much. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, I don't know. Any other comments? Well, I think with that, we can all go uh, have dinner, hopefully have a drink. Ah, no, sorry, Raquel is making a question. Do you see a connection between Centurion's challenging masculinity with the Paraguay war? Yes, that is discussed in the book. That is also discussed on the booklet. 
So something interesting is that, and I forgot to mention this, Pablo mentioned that he loves the booklets of American society. We also have a booklet for Feliciano Centurion. So um, um, this is discussed here. We have this little book, which almost works like a guide. And we have the big book, which is what we are presenting today, the first monograph. Um, but um, yes, and um, uh, you can see that booklet online is available for everybody to read. And that is discussed in many of the texts. Uh, the, the, the relationship to masculinity, I mean, obviously, uh, Paraguay has a very specific uh, cultural relation or anthropological relation to masculinity after in the 19th century. According to several historians, 90% of the adult male population was killed during the Triple, uh, triple War or the Great War, depending on how it's called. That was a, a terrible war in which um, a coalition of Brazilian, Uruguayan and Argentinian troops uh, attacked Paraguay, orchestrated by um, the influence of England, because Paraguay was a very powerful country and was like challenging the dominance of commerce in the region. And during that war, um, something in between 60 and 90 percent of the adult male population was killed. Uh, and uh, the cultural, you know, and uh, sociological effect of that loss is still present today. So being a male and specifically being a queer man in Paraguay, you know, had specific connotations that, you know, that were really challenging. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yes. Yes. Um, so I think with that, uh, we can close the floor. And again, I want to thank you. Oh, no, Milagros is asking. We keep getting questions, but thank you so much. We love this. Uh, would you tell us more about Jose Leonilson and Feliciano Centurion works and biographies? Um, so one comment about that is that America Society did a beautiful, spectacular exhibition about Leonilson a few years ago, and um, there's a great book uh, also edited by Karen Marta with Gabriela Rangel, uh, which uh, was done uh, during that exhibition. And what I can say is that I know through accounts of Ana Lopez, one of Centurion's best friends, is that when uh, Centurion had a chance to travel to Brazil. He saw the work of Leonilson and found it fascinating. So there's a certain connection there. And he really liked that, uh, his work. Um, but uh, they didn't have a chance to meet, even though there are a lot of similarities between their works. And uh, Centurion has started working on fabric and embroidery before knowing about the work of Leonilson. But obviously, once he saw it and he saw the, you know, the similar traits, I mean, he found himself identified with Leonilson. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, either Pablo or Gabriel, and please correct me if I said anything wrong. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I think third is a turn. I don't just, know. just be happy, no, happy to see so many friends, uh, Milagros, uh, Alejandro Sarco, uh, so many people, Felipe Mujica, Joao Modé, so many artists and friends that, uh, that joined. So thank you, all of them, for their time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Pablo. And so, unless we have any more questions, I think now we're finally going to um, close the floor. Um, thank you so much, Pablo, again, for accepting this invitation and doing, we feel very exclusive that this is one of your few or only and live presentations, we feel very special. And thank you for all the praising uh, to the show, the artists and us. And thank you, Gabriel, again, for all your hard work on this spectacular exhibition and for bringing the idea to us. 
and to and making it. And thank you, Karen, for this fantastic book uh, and all the hard work that you do to make our publications so special. And to Todd and to Diana and to Islegen and, and to Ariel. Thank you, everybody, and to the family and to the memory of Feliciano. Bye-bye. <laughs>